All right, good afternoon, everyone. Looks like there's something wrong with this side of the room here since everybody's on this side of the room. But <laughs> okay. All right, well, just a few things at the top, and uh, I'll be glad to take your questions. So as many of you saw in the statement that we released on Friday, Secretary Austin ordered the deployment of additional ballistic missile defense destroyers, fighter squadrons, and tanker aircraft, and several U.S. Air Force B-52 long-range strike bombers to the U.S. Central Command Area of Responsibility. These forces will begin to arrive in coming months as the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group prepares to depart, some of which have already begun to flow into theater as highlighted by the arrival of the B-52 bombers over the weekend. These deployments are in keeping with our commitments to the protection of U.S. citizens and forces in the Middle East, the defense of Israel, and de-escalation through deterrence and diplomacy. These movements build on the recent decision to deploy the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Missile Defense System to Israel, as well as DOD's Sustained Amphibious Ready Group Marine Expeditionary Unit posture in the Eastern Mediterranean, and demonstrative or, and demonstrate the flexible nature of U.S. global defense posture and U.S. capability to deploy worldwide on short notice to meet evolving national security threats. Secretary Austin continues to make clear that should Iran, its partners, or its proxies use this moment to target American personnel or interests in the region, the United States will take every measure necessary to defend our people. Shifting gears, tomorrow is Election Day, and DOD stands prepared to support state and local authorities as required. Of note, Secretary Austin approved a request last week from the District of Columbia for D.C. National Guard troops to support the D.C. Fire and Emergency Medical Services from no November 5 through 13. For those of you who have covered the defense beat for a while, you know that it is routine practice for the DOD to authorize the D.C. National Guard to support or augment security for large-scale events in the district, and activated guardsmen will remain under the command and control of the D.C. National Guard. Similarly, around the nation, approximately 60 National Guardsmen from six states have been activated by their state governors and state active duty status for election support, with roughly another 600 Guardsmen from 17 states on standby if needed. Again, as you know, the National Guard has ongoing and longstanding relationships with local, state, and federal agency partners and has assisted with national special security events like Election Day and Inauguration Day for many years. For more information about individual state responses and activations, I would direct you to the individual states. And finally, the department is proud to celebrate National Native American Heritage Month. This November, we honor the contributions and sacrifices of Native peoples who have served our country. The contributions of these fellow Americans have been pivotal in some of the most critical moments in our nation's defense. As just one of many examples, the U.S. Marine Corps' Navajo code talkers, using their native language to develop an unbreakable communication code during World War II, played a decisive role in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Their example of duty and honor continues to inspire current and future generations of Americans to serve with the same resolve and pride. With that, I'll be glad to take your questions. We'll start with AP, Lita. Thank you, Pat. Um, two things, one um, on Ukraine, uh, North Korea, can you say whether any North Korean troops have been observed in combat or over the line in Ukraine? And I believe, as Stata said, that the number is about 10,000. Is that what you believe are in the Kursk region right now? And then I have a question. Sure. A couple updates. So uh, we believe that there are now at least 10,000 DPRK forces in the Kursk Oblast, uh, recognizing that as we continue to assess DPRK presence on the ground, those numbers could go up slightly in terms of the total number of DPRK troops in Russia. Um, we've seen the press reports uh, about alleged combat ops. We're looking into those, but at this point cannot corroborate those reports. Um, but as you heard Secretary Austin say last week, should these troops engage in combat support operations against Ukraine, uh, they would become legitimate military targets. So have you seen any additional North Korean forces heading for Eastern Russia? Do you see sort of another wave of influx? Uh, I don't know that I'd call it a wave, uh, but as we look at those numbers, um, we think that the total number of DPRK forces in Russia total could be closer to around 11 to 12,000, um, with about 10,000, at least 10,000 right now in the Kursk Oblast. Okay. And you said you had a follow-up? Um, just on Iran, have you seen any 
movement indications or any suggestions that Iran has been taking steps to do any type of retaliatory action against Israel? Yeah, so um, in terms of whether or not Iran does anything, I'm, I'm not going to speculate, uh, nor will I discuss intelligence assessments uh, from here. Uh, I think we as, as the U.S. government have been very clear uh, that we believe Iran should not respond to Israel's retaliation if they choose to do so. Um, we, of course, will support Israel in their defense. Natasha. Thanks, Pat. So uh, senior Ukrainian officials have said that they are observing some very small limited numbers of North Korean troops, things like engineers, for example, in the occupied territories in eastern Ukraine. The U.S., are, are you not prepared to corroborate that at this point? Yeah, again, we're, we're looking into all of that, but at this point just can't corroborate uh, those reports. Okay, and also we're about a week away from the deadline that was set by Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken with regard to Gaza. The State Department just said that they have not yet seen enough being done in northern Gaza in terms of humanitarian aid. Has the, the Secretary agree with that? Um, well, I think, uh, as you highlight, at the State Department on Thursday when Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin addressed this, um, both of them highlighted that we believe more needs to be done in terms of getting humanitarian assistance into Gaza and to the Palestinian people. I'd point you to Secretary Blinken's remarks in terms of sort of the, the rundown of, of where things stand on that front. Uh, but even in his call uh, last week on Thursday with Minister Gallant, Secretary Austin continues to reinforce how important it is to ensure that humanitarian assistance can flow uh, and flow faster into Gaza. And so that will continue to be something that we will remain focused on. Constantine. Thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> just uh, one follow-up on the National Guard deployments. Um, you said um, guardsmen have de been deployed for uh, put on active orders from six states. Can you say what those six states are? Um, we can. G I don't have that list here in front of me. Let me just double check, Constantine, make sure. Um, I don't have that list here in front of me, but we can certainly get that for you. Okay. And then sort of on the same vein, is the uh, Department of Defense providing any cyber uh, resources or um, capabilities for uh, election monitoring or sort of anti-misinformation efforts? Um, well, as you know, uh, U.S. Cyber Command does play a role uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, our elections. I'd refer you to them to, to go into details. Uh, and uh, there are uh, National Guard elements that do support U.S. Cyber Command, but they, they can provide you more details on that. Thank you. No? Mm -hmm. A couple of cleanup questions on North Korea. The eleven to 12,000 number that you said that leaves a bandwidth between those in Kursk and those still in eastern Russia, do you expect those remaining troops to head toward Kursk in the coming days? Yeah, I mean, again, we fully expect, you know, just based on, on what we're seeing, that, that these forces uh, will uh, go to the Kursk region, that they will provide uh, some kind of capability. You know, all indications are that they will provide some type of combat or combat support uh, capability. Again, remains to be seen exactly how they will be employed. I'd point you to the comments that were made uh, on Thursday in terms of things like uh, UAV ops, artillery, infantry. So uh, again, uh, should they be employed in combat, they will become legitimate military targets. And we would fully expect that the Ukrainians uh, would do what they need to do to defend themselves uh, and their personnel. And do all of those in Kursk that are North Korean troops have Russian uniforms and equipment at this point, as you understand? My understanding is that all of these forces are being uh, issued Russian uniforms and Russian equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, one more follow-up on the Middle East. The deployments that were announced on Friday, are these based on new assessments of the threat that Iran may pose within a, a retaliation toward Israel or possibly American troops? Or is this simply about trying to reinforce the U.S. force posture there, given that the carrier will depart in the coming weeks? Well, I think as we highlighted in our, our statement, uh, and as I highlighted at the top here, um, we are deploying these forces to the region to preserve our ability to protect our forces, support the defense of Israel, uh, and also act as a deterrent capability. And so um, out of due diligence and ensuring that we continue to be prepared to meet our commitments, um, deploying and rotating these forces in as we uh, look ahead down the road and uh, prepare for the departure of the, the Abe. Okay. Mike. Yeah, these North Korean units, are, do you know if the soldiers are being, uh, are they filling blanks, you know, spots in the Russian line, or are they, or will they be deploying and operating as their own uh, particular units? So a couple things. Um, it, it 
it's TBD. Um, we'll see exactly how these forces are integrated into Russian operations uh, and how they're um, committed to to the battlefield, uh, assuming that they are. Um, in terms of replacement for Russian forces, you know, I'd point you back again to what Secretary Austin highlighted in terms of the significant casualty rates that we're seeing among Russian forces. So in so much as that these are uh, potentially forces that are coming in uh, to replace the, the massive numbers of losses that Russia is experiencing. I think that's probably a, a fair assessment, uh, and I certainly would not want to be a, a North Korean soldier. Right, but my point is, I mean, are, are they going to be inserted into already existing Russian units as just spare body, spare body, spare body, or will they, will there be North Korean battalion fighting here and North Korean battalion fighting yeah. here? Or, or do you not know at this yeah, point? Yeah, we, we don't know at this point, we'll, and we'll see. Um, you know, we, we anticipate uh, in, in the relatively near future uh, we will know more as we see how Russia uh, and North Korea opt to employ these forces. Okay. Charlie? Oh, thank you, General. Um, adding to that, do you anticipate or, or are you even tracking uh, whether or not this may just be the first of many North Koreans that will, will be headed to Russia? That's my first question. My second question is, Regarding Iran's threats of retaliation, they said that it will come from Iran mm. or Iranian-backed um, militias, which you've already seen in Iraq. First of all, have you seen an uptick in the tempo of drone attacks from Iranian-backed militias there against Israel and or against U.S. forces? Does it look orchestrated, and how much of it is, is it a concern that bigger stuff might be headed there like ballistic missiles? Yeah, on your, on your first question, uh, that is definitely something that we're keeping a close eye on. I don't have anything right now uh, to pass along in terms of whether or not DPRK will or won't send additional forces, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to speculate on whether they do, but definitely something we're keeping a close eye on. Um, as far as, um, you know, the threats that have been communicated uh, in the press and in social media about the potential for Iran to launch attacks from uh, Iraqi territory. What I would say is that over the last year, um, we've seen Iran-backed militia groups sporadically launch missiles and one-way attack UAVs from Syria and Iraq towards Israel. Uh, the vast majority of those uh, have been intercepted or fail in flight. Um, and while we've recently observed an increase in one-way attack UAVs uh, assessed to be against Israel, um, at this stage we would not characterize these as large numbers. Uh, and so we continue to remain vigilant and we remain ready to defend U.S. forces in Israel from these threats. And, and are you tracking any movement of ballistic missiles in and out of that region? Uh, I don't have anything uh, to pass along in terms of intelligence assessments uh, from this podium, but again, we stand ready to support the defense of Israel uh, and would encourage uh, Iran not to launch any type of retaliatory attack. Louis? Um, you know, we've been talking about the 10,000 troops in Kursk, but can you give us some context, please? Um, this 10,000, how much will they augment the Russian presence there? Will they be a significant portion? <coughs> of the presence there in that particular oblast? Um, are they a very small component? Can you, just something so yeah. that we can understand what adding 10,000 North Koreans to that battle space means. Sure. I think to do that, you have to go back in time a little bit. And if you re recall, when uh, Ukraine conducted their offensive into Russian territory, into the Kursk oblast, uh, and they continue to hold Russian territory uh, in Kursk. Uh, and they have made the decision to hold that territory at risk uh, and continue to defend it. And so what we saw uh, in the early days of that Ukrainian offensive was a very muddled Russian response in terms of um, trying to push the Ukrainians back. Um, and for the most part, they, all, they have not been able to push the Ukrainians uh, very far. You know, they've taken some incremental uh, amounts of territory back, but but nothing that we would categorize as significant. So, placing uh, these additional, you know, ten to eleven to twelve thousand forces uh, in Kursk is definitely something uh, from a combat capability standpoint that could be significant. But a lot of that will depend on how those forces are employed, how they're integrated into the Russian command and control, uh, and of course. Uh, if the Ukrainians, if, if the 
past is any indicator of the future. Uh, the Ukrainians are uh, battle-hardened veterans uh, who know how to fight. Uh, and so uh, every indication that, that they will continue to defend uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and continue to defend Kursk, uh, uh, the territory that they've taken. And so we'll see how that plays out. Numerically, it, and, you know, size-wise, numerically, is it, you know, the infusion of these 10,000 additional troops at a minimum, uh, is that really significant to the force that you say has been making incremental gains? Well, you know, I think, again, if you look at, if you want to talk numbers, and, and again, numbers can be misleading, because look what Ukraine did when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, and how a small number of forces to date have been able to uh, largely defeat the strategic objectives of what was and is the largest army in Europe. So again, a lot of that just depends on how Russia uh, opts to employ those forces, how well they're integrated, uh, what kind of combat experience they have. Uh, and so we'll see. In the meantime, we continue to consult very closely with our allies and partners. Uh, and we also continue to ensure that we're working with Ukraine and some 50 nations to rush security assistance to Ukraine to defend uh, Ukrainian sovereignty both here uh, and elsewhere in the battlefield. Let me go to the phone uh, real quick here. Let's go to uh, Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Hey, General, for your time today. Uh, there's often a perception in the Pentagon and across Washington that uh, aircraft carriers deter Iran and the lack of one in the region uh, emboldens them. Uh, two questions, I guess, related. Uh, does Secretary Austin see these newly announced deployments on, on Friday uh, to the region as sufficient uh, to deter Iran with a carrier gap potentially coming? Uh, and can you put this in this decision in context of how you're looking at broader threats uh, in the Pacific and, and other regions? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, so wh when it comes to uh, U.S. force deployments around the world, um, while there's understandable focus on particular types of equipment and uh, you know vessels to include aircraft carriers. At the end of the day, it really comes down uh, to our people and the capabilities uh, that we provide. And so uh, the capabilities that we're deploying into the region uh, will provide a significant amount of capability on par uh, with what we've been doing uh, in the uh, Middle East region since the October 7 attacks. Uh, over a year ago. And so uh, certainly as we look at global force management and our national security commitments around the world, that's always taking into account in terms of how we can meet those commitments and ensure we have what we need to protect our people. And in this case, also support the defense of Israel. Let me go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. You know, thank you. Two separate questions. Um, now that the election is upon us, is the Defense Department satisfied that all overseas troops and their uh, spouses have the access they need to a federal absentee balance? Also, how should one describe the uh, coalition between North Korea and Russia? Is it an alliance or is it more friends with benefits? Thanks, Jeff. Um, let me take your question on voting first. Uh, so first of all, we continue to recommend all voters uh, register and request an absentee ballot. Um, you know, those deadlines vary depending on states. Uh, and, and as you know, uh, we do have a, a robust education program in terms of getting the word out on how service members and their families can obtain uh, their absentee ballots, uh, uh, you know, no matter where you are, whether it's overseas uh, or whether it's stationed out outside of your state. Uh, just speaking from personal experience as a uh, Florida resident, uh, I can tell you I received multiple emails uh, over many weeks reminding me to register and to request my ballot. It, re it arrived uh, early, I uh, had plenty of time uh, to, to submit that. Um, if a service member uh, has requested a ballot and it hasn't arrived, they can use the federal write-in absentee ballot immediately uh, at fvap.gov backslash fwab, uh, and this acts as a backup ballot. And again, that information is provided on multiple occasions uh, through multiple mechanisms. Uh, so uh, again, encourage folks to get out and vote uh, and uh, make sure that their voice is heard. Uh, as far as the uh, relationship 
uh, between Russia and North Korea goes. Uh, we definitely continue to monitor this. Uh, the, the, the level of cooperation between the two uh, remains concerning, uh, but in many ways transactional. Uh, and so again, this is something we'll, we'll keep a close eye on and uh, I'll just leave it there. Okay, uh, yes, sir. You know, um, last week, uh, as we said, um, that the Secretary Austin all times uh, he uh, urged for a ceasefire in Lebanon as quickly as pos possible. So, um, do you uh, think uh, we need more time? That Israel needs more time to stop this war to achieve their goals. Um, how long do you believe that will take this war? Is it as we said before? It was a limited operations, but now, now, like almost a month starting this war. So, do they need more weeks? Uh, months or, or maybe we're going to see like what's happened in Gaza like over a year for this war thing. Yeah, I won't speak for Israel, um, but Secretary Austin and others have been very clear uh, that we believe that a ceasefire uh, and the resolution of tensions uh, in the region through diplomatic means uh, are required uh, as soon as possible. And so as you've seen, uh, with the uh, State Department uh, and the uh, U.S. envoy, uh, Mr. Hochstein, going to the region. Uh, this continues to be something that is a top priority for the U.S., working with partners in the region to include Israel. Uh, and we'll continue to uh, communicate that to our Israeli counterparts. Uh, as you saw from our readout, this was also something that came up in the phone call between Secretary Austin and Minister Gallant last week. Thank you. Okay, let me go to uh, Heather from USNI. Thank you so much. Um, I was hoping you could um, give a couple more details about the plans with the with Abe and then um, whether or not it's planning to leave within the next couple weeks, the next week. And then Harry S. Truman is on its way over to um, the Middle East Mediterranean area, but it's making stops along its way. Is this an indication that we don't feel that there needs to be an aircraft carrier in the region very quickly. It does this what does this indicate in terms of um, how much the Houthi threat remains in the Middle East? Yeah, thanks, Heather. As far as uh, deployment timelines go, um, you know, as a matter of policy and, and operation security, we're not going to talk uh, specifics on uh, when the Abraham Lincoln uh, strike group will depart the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility. As for the Truman, as you highlight, it uh, continues to operate uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into its particular movements or, or forecast those. Uh, and in terms of the message it sends, it just demonstrates the flexibility and versatility of the U.S. military in order uh, and our ability to meet our national security commitments and provide robust capability around the world and, and flex as needed. Uh, and again, highlighted by the fact that you have B-52 bombers uh, that are now in the AOR, the CENTCOM AOR, uh, that are multi-versatile and can provide uh, an incredible amount of capability in support of those efforts. So uh, again, it's about capability uh, and it's about our people. And we're confident that we have the right force posture to support our national security uh, requirements. Ashley. Um, just a quick follow-up on the announcement on um, troops to the Middle East. Um, are there any plans to send additional um, troops into Israel or to man assets there? I, I don't have anything to announce at this point. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Uh, thank you, General. Do you anticipate any direct uh, Israel attack on Iranian paramilitary groups in Iraq as they continuously launch UAVs into Israel? I mean, did you send any message to these groups in Iraq? Um, I, I, yeah, as I'm sure you can appreciate, w won't speak for Israeli operations uh, on what they may or may not do. I can tell you that, you know, what we've seen in the past uh, is them, as I highlighted earlier, intercept uh, threats that are heading towards Israel. Um, but in terms of potential future military action by Israel, that's a question for them to address. Okay. Might, might that not be something that CENTCOM would engage in, the potential attack, or if you want to call it a preemptive strike? Well, again, without, without getting into hypotheticals or speaking to Israeli operations, 
U.S. Central Command uh, and the Department of Defense regularly have conversations with Israel as it relates to the defense of Israel uh, and how we can work together uh, to support that effort. Uh, and as I highlighted earlier, uh, if, it, if we do see threats emanating from other regions, uh, we're prepared to support the defense of Israel and have, as you know, we've demonstrated in the past. Uh, Howard Altman, War Zone. Hey, thanks, Pat. A couple of things. I wanted to drill down a little bit on the uh, North Koreans in Kursk. Uh, images appear online that shows a, a North Korean troop uh, killed in that uh, in Kursk. And then my other question is, is there been any change in the U.S. Uh, warship presence in the Red Sea to protect um, shipping, commercial shipping? And, and if so, how has that changed? And any change in operation um, uh, I forget what the name is. The, the operation protecting ships in the Red Sea. Thanks, Howard. Um, on on your first question again, um, I've seen those press and social media reports. Again, we're looking into them, but I, I cannot corroborate those reports at this time. Uh, as it relates to uh, force posture in the Red Sea uh, and and elsewhere, um, I'm not going to get into specifics in terms of. Um, which ships are there and, and what their movement plans are other than to say, yes, we do maintain uh, robust capability to support Operation Prosperity Guardian and support our efforts to uh, support na uh, freedom of navigation and the safety of mariners in the region. Okay, do one more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a quick follow-up, Pat, on Louis' questions. What's the U.S. estimate on the number of Russian forces in the Kursk region? I, I don't have a number to provide to you. I, I, I don't even have a ballpark number other than to say, uh, broadly speaking, what we saw in the past uh, was a, essentially a conglomeration of various units on the Russian side uh, to include territorial defense forces um, attempting to to uh, push the Ukrainians back. I think I'm oh, trying to get a sense of kind of perspective, right? Is it... Ten, you know, now almost, you know, largely North Korean troops there, equal number of both. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're trying sure. to figure out. Uh, and, I, and I just don't have a number to, to pass along here. I mean, keeping in mind, again, that what we're talking about here is Russian territory writ large, right? So, I mean, this is inside Russian uh, interior lines. Uh, and theoretically, Russia could have made the decision a long time ago to to move large number of Russian forces to address this threat, but it demonstrates a couple things. One, uh, the fact that Russia has not made recovery of its sovereign territory a priority. And number two, uh, the fact that, that Russia finds itself in a situation where they now have to hire out to get additional forces uh, to deal with this issue. Uh, which, as Secretary Austin has highlighted, is an indication of the dire straits uh, they're in when it comes to personnel. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.